Good day, everyone. I'm Simran from the Centre for Women and Gender Studies, and I'll be the facilitator for today. Thank you all for joining us today, and we welcome you all to the conversation and book launch that is in collaboration with the Centre for Women and Gender Studies at Nelson Mandela University, the Chair for Critical Studies in Higher Education Transformation at NMU, the Saatchi Chair in African Feminist Imaginations at Nelson Mandela University, and the Saatchi Chair in Sexualities, Genders and Queer Studies at the University of Forte. Today's proceedings include a conversation and a book launch with a Q&A session towards the end. We please ask that you stay on mute as the panelists are speaking. And for the Q&A session, you may raise your hand or leave your questions in the chat box below. Over to you, Professor Keith. Thank you so much, uh, Samran. Um, and it's uh, fantastic, you know, uh, to get some of our discussions going and especially on, on such a very, very important topic. So hello, friends and friends. Uh, very warm Nelson Mandela University. Welcome to the African Africana Queer Presence book launch. So today we are honored to have with us Dr. Ensen Nyak, the author of this book and the research associate, we proudly say, of the Chair for Critical Studies in Higher Education Transformation. African Africana Queer Presence is the prompt today for a broader discussion of her important work on gender, sexuality, and politics on the continent. SN, thanks so much for associating with us and putting your work forward as an asset to our university and beyond, and the general intellectual space of the academy and the communities in whose names it exists. We are very, very grateful uh, and we will have to uh, find a way for you to come this side of the world, you know, as soon as things work out a bit better. Zetu, you are such a great co-traveler of our university and the work of Babalwa at our center and that of Pumla at the Sarchi chair. So many, many thanks for this, you know. So we are totally elated in having the two of you engaging on this, uh, the work that, uh, that SN has put together. We are also grateful to have Dr. Nehemia Atala responding to the book and bringing his unique transdisciplinary and creative perspective on gender, sexuality, and the body. Also a fantastic co-traveler of our work on the transformation of the university. Thanks, Nehemia. So this conversation on book loans is a collaboration between the Center for, the Women, and, uh, for Women and Gender Studies, the Chair for Critical Studies in Higher Education Transformation, the NRFDSI Sarchi Chair in African Feminist Imaginations at Nelson Mandela University, and the NRFDSI Sarchi Chair in Sexualities, Genders, and Queer Studies at the University of Fort Hare. Amazing. The full title of the book under discussion today is African Africana Queer Presence, Ethics and Politics of Negotiation. The concept of negotiation is key to Essence thesis as it draws from African propositions of Negro feminism and the practical humanism of Senghor to reflect on the conditions and possibilities of queerness affirmation as an ethics of presence. This is an important refusal of the colonial and post-colonial logics that create binary oppositions between the ideal and non-ideal categories and negate queerness in the process. Essence work is fundamentally productive as it offers an ethical and embodied vision of an ecological depth of feeling and, and will as foundational to relational possibilities within the African Africana world. As a university with a vision to be a dynamic African university recognized for its leadership in generating cutting edge knowledge for a sustainable future, it is essential that we engage with African Africana scholarship, in particular scholarship that helps us think through what kind of socially just futures we would like to imagine along with our societies. Dr. Nyaks prompt us to consider these futures from an African Africana queer perspective, foregrounding the importance of relationality, negotiation, and ethics in the work 
of crafting African Africana possibilities. We are greatly looking forward to the conversation that will be unfolding today and that we as a university can learn from. Once again, a warm welcome to Essen, to Zetu, to uh, Nehemia, to Babalwa and to Pumla and our colleagues and collaborators across the four partners and to all of you who are attending today. Thank you for your time and for the insights that you will be sharing with us today. A warm welcome and many thanks once again. Thank you for that wonderful welcome. I now hand over to Dr. Babawa Mahukana to introduce the speakers. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Professor Kurt and uh, Simran for facilitating. Um, we enjoy such a beautiful support, I always say, in this part of the region uh, uh, globally because of the kind of leadership at the top level of the university like this one by Professor Kiet. Uh, we're trying to create spaces where we can actually have this conversation and hopefully uh, uh, transform our attitudes and also our cultures towards uh, betterment for all. And uh, colleagues, before I, I, I introduce the speakers uh, for today, I just thought that it is quite uh, um, necessary and also fitting for us today to reflect and just to have a conversation around the issues on sexuality, negotiation, ethics, queer epistemologies by Essen, Zetu, and later on Nehemiah, who is our uh, uh, pride and joy in terms of uh, 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 transdisciplinary studies within the university. And, and I think uh, globally, when we experience so much uh, attacks on uh, uh, bodily freedom, sexual elite, sexuality, you know, the attack on the legislations, on abortion, and, and, and all these uh, uh, issues, to have this kind of conversation and, and, and um, to put back, you know, and, and to actively fight back what Neil Smith calls uh, the revenge of the capital, and I call it the revenge of the patriarchs in the global political space. You know, it's important that we do not become complacent of what we have in this part of the world in South Africa when it comes to sexuality and freedoms. I think it is important to have this conversation, and it's an honor, obviously, to have uh, uh, Dr. Nyek, uh, Essen Nyek, uh, uh, and, and, and Professor Zetu Matebeni, who are the key leading thinkers, you know, um, in this particular area of African and Africana queer uh, studies, you know, in this part of the world. And um, let me just introduce colleagues, the, the three speakers who have graced us today as uh, the collaboration between uh, Krishat, CWGS, uh, uh, the two NRF uh, uh, chairs chaired by uh, Professor Gola and Professor uh, Matebeni that are here today. It's such a privilege to, to, to have worked with uh, Jenny. I just need to mention that uh, uh, in putting together this beautiful conversation. Thank you so much, Jenny, even if you are behind the scenes. And um, uh, Dr. Nyek uh, Essen holds a PhD in political science from the University of California, in Los Angeles, uh, with a specialization in international relations and comparative politics. To date, she has pursued two research streams. The first stream is centered on political economy of development, governance, and public procurement reform, with an interest in social justice and gender responsive schemes. The other stream, reflects on gender, sexuality, and politics. Dr. Nyek is currently pursuing another doctoral uh, uh, degree in practical theology at Virginia Theological Seminary to expand her research on identity, sexuality, and politics to the analysis of intercultural and ecumenical inclusive epistemologies and practices. 
She has written extensively on interdisciplinary topics such as sexuality, politics, public policy, gender equality, ethics, and religion, public procurement reform, economic inclusion, and human rights. Her publications include Sexual Diversity in Africa, <clears throat> Politics, Theory, and Citizenship, which was co-edited with Mark Eprecht in 2013, Public Procurement and Governance Reform in Africa, which was published in 2016, a Rutledge Handbook of Queer African Studies, published in 2019, African and Africana Queer Presence, which is a book that will be launching later on, which was published last year. Dr. Nyek is a visiting uh, scholar at the Vulnerability and Human Condition Initiative, Emory School of Law, Emory University in the United States, the book review editor for the Journal of Africana Religion, a former fellow with African Multiple Cluster of Excellence, Beirith Academy of Advanced African Studies in Germany, and a board member of the West African Research Association headquartered at Boston University. Um, she will be joining, I think she has joined the ethnic studies of the University of Colorado uh, at Boulder in uh, 2022 as an associate professor. We welcome you, uh, Dr. Essen Yek, and we are privileged to have you here. Obviously, uh, we have our visiting professor at the CWGS, a friend, an ally, a colleague, uh, Professor Zetu Matebeni, as a sociologist and activist, a writer whose research focuses on the development of African queer studies. She has worked at different universities in South Africa and has been part of decolonizing interventions, including the hashtag Roads Must Fall and the Black Academic Caucus at the University of Cape Town. Zetu has edited and co-edited various volumes on African LGBTQI life, including Reclaiming African Queer Perspectives on Sexual and Gender Identities, published in 2014, Queer in Africa, LGBTI Identity, Citizenship and Activism, published in 2018, and Beyond the Mountain, Queer Life in Africa's Gay Capital, published last year in 2021 by UNISA Press. Since 2020, she has been a visiting professor at the Nelson Mandela University, a center for women and gender studies. Zetu holds the National Research Foundation South African Research Chair in Sexualities, Genders, and Queer Studies at the University of Forte. Um, Zetu has been a very consistent partner in the journey uh, since the beginning and the establishing of the Center for Women and Gender Studies in 2019. Welcome, Zetu. It's always a pleasure having you here. I hope that you know that you always have a space whenever you want to take a break to come back to the site. And lastly, our third uh, respondent today, um, Dr. Nehemiah Latola, is a special one because he is uh, uh, he holds a doctoral uh, degree in chemistry here at Nelson Mandela University. He's an artist. He exp as an artist, he explores themes on gender, sexuality, the body, using science, fashion, and poetry, and media expression. Uh, 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 Dr. Latola is one of the diverse uh, uh, products of this university, and now he's currently a postdoctoral fellow in the chemistry department within Nelson Mandela University. He's a poet. He's also within the arts field. We always like having you around, Ney, um, and we thank you so much for making yourself available to have to be part of this conversation. Colleagues, right now, I think I just need to let you know also of some of the key things that we are talking about when it comes to the book itself, the book that we will be launching, that Ney will be responding to later on, is titled African Africana Queer Presence, Ethics and Politics of Negotiation. It is authored by Essen Nyek, who is here today. 
we thought we should provide a brief about the book, which is um, um, the book is about the notion of queerness presented uh, and takes the view that the process of conceptualizing selves out of order is fundamentally anti-dialectical, negotiated, political, and spiritual. Queerness negation manifested as a form of colonial and post-colonial epistemic and political violence defines reality as the clash of ideal and non-ideal categories. The book reflects on the conditions and possibilities of queerness affirmation as an ethics of presence grounded in the politics of negotiation following the proposition of uh, uh, Negro feminism and the practical humanism of Senghor to offer an ethical and embodied uh, uh, vision of an ecological depth of feeling and will as a foundational to re relational possibilities within the African and Africana world. With those few words, colleagues, um, please help me to welcome uh, Professor Esenyek, Professor Zetumatebeni on stage so that they can start the conversation. You're welcome, colleagues. Thank you. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. I now hand over to Dr. Nyek and Professor Matabeni. So much, uh, Baba Lua, for um, that introduction. Um, what a fantastic opportunity and joy to be in conversation with um, a fantastic scholar, Dr. SN Yek. Thank you for making the time, SN. Congratulations on the book, Africana Queer Presence, which we'll be launching or talking about in detail today. It is the official launch of the book, as Mabala said, and I'm delighted to be part of curating this launch with colleagues at the Nelson Mandela University. But before we get into this conversation, I want to acknowledge the presence of all the people who have joined us, the energies and spirits that have made this day possible and what it is today. So thank you all for joining from the different parts of the world where you're located and welcome to the launch of Queen Mothers, Coco, Dr. Esenyek, Africana Queer Presence. I'm sure we will have a very rich and, enrich and enriching conversation today. Coco, do you have any <laughs> opening words? <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, my friend. Um, for those who uh, don't understand what she's talking about, <laughs> she just called me by my... Uh, um, um, I would say my new title, which is Coco. Uh, just I recently became a matriarch. Um, I am originally from Cameroon, and um, that is my title. So um, I'm also speaking from a kind of an indigenous uh, perspective. Yes, uh, thank you very much. <laughs> I'm happy to be here. Wonderful, thank you. So. Um, because I've known you for long and our friendship spans over a few years, I felt it was proper to have a conversation with you that also sort of tracks your own scholarly contributions to sexuality studies, African queer studies, and Africana queer presence, as you put it in the last book. So not to eliminate all the other works you've produced as Babalo has um, talked about them, um, I focused on, th on the three texts that have shaped this field as a way of ma mapping your own thinking and trajectory, as well as the necessary shifts in the field as you point them out so eloquently in your latest monograph, Africana Queer Presence. So where I start is really at sexual diversity in Africa, okay? And the handbook on Afri African queer studies, the Routledge handbook on African queer studies. And here, Gogo, it's, it's, it's really about thinking about the terms we use. And this is where I start this conversation. So in that introduction in Sexual Diversity in Africa with Mark Eppert, you say, and I quote, some authors prefer the term queer, some homosexualities, some LGBTI and so on. Rather than explain the justification and debates each and every time, we opted for a term that everyone can agree 
is the least controversial and most widely used LGBTI, close quote. And then I, I take uh, the introduction in African queer studies in the uh, handbook, African queer studies, and you offer the use of the term queer. And this is what you say about queer. Queer as a non-exhaustive umbrella for non-heteronormative sexualities and gender identities. So my question is, it's really about the controversies in terminologies and in naming. And this comes up a lot in our work in issues around sexuality, particularly queer studies. Why have you, how have you reconciled with that in your own work, the shift from LGBTI or shift from homosexuality to LGBTI and what each term or movement opens up or forecloses um, in your own work? Uh, thank you. That is a very, very good question. Um, sexual diversity is written at a particular moment. Um, I think you and I were graduate students. You remember when we were yes. young? <laughs> and um, I organized, I think, what was the first uh, scholarly meeting in Africa. It was in Senegal. And some of us were just trying to get our feet wet, trying to figure out what is it that we were actually doing? And no one else was talking about anything um, concerning LGBTI, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so um, I think at that point, um, the LGBTI was emerging as a framework to talk about that which we were identifying and embodying in different ways. So I think uh, that term reflects the politics of, of, of the time. Um, in my second rendition, I use queer in part because uh, the acronym is getting too long. And I think it, we might exhaust all the letters of the alphabet if we, we're not careful. Now, the issue or the, 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 I'm not contending, I'm not contesting actually the use of those letters. I'm just saying that to me, it indicates a discomfort, you know, something that is not quite captured by the acronym. So queer, as I go back to it, um, I find it useful in part because it means anything and everything at the same time. It's a placeholder, if you want. And I think also, which is truly important, and I think this is perhaps um, another direction um, of, of not only my, my work, but also yours, is that um, queer doesn't vacate sexuality, but at least it doesn't make sexuality the ultimate focus uh, of the panoptical gaze, be it uh, an intellectual gaze or societal or political gaze. I think that to some extent, um, there is uh, an obsession um, that sometimes border pornographic um, obsession with sexuality in what we call queer studies. Um, the last thing I want to say about it is that um, where can we go um, uh, post-queer? Because mm -hmm. queer also, even as I find it uh, a nice way to, to avoid being stabbed, at, you know, because I forgot somebody's letter <laughs> when I'm writing, um, we have to recognize it is also very tied to a particular way of addressing gender and sexuality in the West. It is like queer, queer theory. So perhaps uh, as a core call, I, I have to say, we have uh, many ways of addressing ourselves as African. And I think that in part, we haven't really, we have no idea about the depths and the, the richness of our languages and our imagination. And I do believe that a part of what needs to also be done uh, is to go back and, and ex excavate the, the, the meanings that are already embedded in our society, looking at our languages and the way we inflect it in order to, to, to imagine a post-queer, you know, where, where it, it ceases to be a placeholder, but something that has given itself 
to, to, to something that can be recognized as a, 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 an innovative way of Africanizing that which we're talking about. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Great. I'm, I'm so grateful that you've actually mentioned this fascination and the kind of like uh, pull always towards sexuality. And uh, yeah, I mean, the way you describe it is kind of also pornographic <laughs> in queer studies. Yeah, I, I think, yeah, I'm sure people, people will have something to say about that because uh, I think a lot, of our, a lot of the work that we see on queer studies focuses predominantly on sexuality with the exclusion of all other intersecting um, issues, which you do point out in, in the book, Africana Queer Presence. Um, but let me go back. So in African queer studies, are two points which I feel were already, you were already alluding to your thinking about Africana queer presence. Okay, if we're paying attention, we would have seen that this is where you are taking us. And the first is what you call, and I quote, building a queer ethic based on mutuality. Okay, and the second is the assertion, again, I quote from you, queer bodies in Africa are deeply spiritual. So I'm interested in those two notions. So can you talk a bit more about the queer ethic and also on the spiritual nature of queer bodies in Africa? Man, you're deep today. <laughs> <laughs> I'm talking um, to you, how else can I be? <laughs> um, well, it, it is, I don't think I'll be lying here that if we um, sort of uh, scam the field, scam the field and uh, we will realize that there hasn't been anything written about ethics. There is a lot about rights. There is a lot about rights. You know, but when we take the um, um, African Convention on Human and People's Rights, um, I am interested by the way uh, these two words appear, rights and duties. So um, rights tend to we tend to think of them as um, things that are absolute, um, mostly conferred by the abstract law and the state. And there is nothing wrong with it. Uh, duties is um, a lot more complex than that because you know somebody just started off uh, talking about the issue of abortion, for example. You know, Some people would say, well, the states want you to carry your baby, you know, they want to, enforce it, right? Um, but no state can command K. Uh -huh. K, you know, we, we, we may have the right to feed the baby and do that and not abort the baby. And, but the issue of K is, is, is deep, is deep. It's not just a matter of doing. It is a matter of giving oneself in a different way. So I was really concerned about the fact that we were not talking about ethics mm -hmm. and not talking about ethics in the context of queer studies when we only talk about human rights is really, I think, dangerous because what we have seen uh, in terms of world politics, especially also in terms of Africa is that uh, human right discourse can be leveraged for any type of end. You know, we have body, body and friends today. Um, I'm not gonna say anything about this dictatorship regime, you know, um, but if I don't really like you, I might just call you a human right abuser. So we know that that discourse is manipulated, right? It's not, it's not frozen in, in time. It doesn't bear any, any ethical standards that we can say, okay, now this is, this is really purely human rights. So um, uh, the, the, the question I'm alluding to or the concern is that we should be entertaining the possibilities that critique coming from African society is not crazy. And that is to say, it is possible that in what we, we have contributed to as queer studies or, or activism is in fact also, or at least some aspects of it, um, a way of undermining Africa as a thing. And, 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 and when you sit with that idea, for me, at least as an African intellectual, I have to be extremely careful and I have to be comfortable with taking that critique, that bite from, from, from society, as opposed to just saying, 
oh, 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 you people are the homophobes, you know, I got it right. So, and the spiritual thing here is, you know, as a political scientist, um, we study power and institutionalize institutions and, and things like that. But um, what spirituality does, it creates a space where um, that is very humbling. It says that unlike our enlightenment ideas, we are actually not the center of everything. It forces us to recognize that there is a beyond us. Whether we're talking about our ancestors, we are linked, but we are not the thing that in of itself is finite. Politics talks about change. Spirituality talks about transformation. And you don't transform by dictating transformation to other people. It, it imposes a demand on the self, an ethical uh, relational thing on the self that requires that one's transform first from within before transforming the other. That is not the realm of politics. There is no uh, prerequisite anywhere in the world. If I want to be a presidential candidate, in fact, in, in political scientists say, oh, this is the candidate talking. I promise you this, I promise you that, right? And once you become president, oh, that was the candidate talking. So we have, that is, we, 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 the word politics is like a game. Nobody's really held to any standard, right? In terms of the person, the character. So I was thinking about the possibility to going back to this African idea anyway, that we have a space in society for training character. You can have rights, but have a character that just stinks. And that is what I want to do in kind of bringing these two concepts or two words together uh, because without that, we will develop the head. We will talk fancy stuff, but we will not be able to relate to the heart. So that is the, the, the way um, that I think is interesting. There is a compassionate way we can listen to the self because guess what? There will never be a day where queerness will exist and Africa won't. So I am African first and everything else after. Thank you. Sure. <laughs> wow, wow, wow. I know. <laughs> uh, no, yeah, go, go. Uh, I didn't see that one coming. Um, I'm just, I'm just still, you know, um, processing what you just said about relating to the self in, um, um, as a form of an ethical practice and, and how you can, you know, transforming the self first before you can transform society. Um, yeah, I think there's a lot to think about there. And I will probably come back to this because at the end of uh, Africana queer presence, we do bring us back to this notion, particularly the idea of Muntu. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, <laughs> I, 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 I'm, I'm still processing everything that you're saying. It's, it, it's, it's already a lot. <laughs> uh, thank you, thank you. So let's go now to the book, Africana Queer Presence, because actually what you were going through was what was your thinking um, and, and introducing us to, to these ideas in, of ethics uh, and relationality or mutuality. And we've talked about relation, um, relationality. Um, in, in the, the Routledge Handbook of African Queer Studies. But now we are going to the book that we are launching today. Uh, and again, I want to say congratulations. Congratulations, sister, congratulations, queen mother. Uh, in this book, I felt all of you. And I don't know if that makes sense to you, but I really felt all of you. Uh, and such encounters array in academic and scholarly books. So, for you, what were some of the energies that brought you to this book? Um, I know it might be an odd question, but I'm curious about it. What are the energies that brought you here? It is not actually odd. Um, I think um, it talks about, um, at least your questions um, reminds me of uh, the difficulty of writing that introduction. Believe it, the introduction was kind of the hardest. 
thing to write of our books. Um, and it is hard to read. <laughs> So it's a it's a place of loss, loss mm -hmm. and um, rebirth. Mm -hmm. You know, um, you and I sort of finished grad school almost at the same time, and you know, I, I had a, I, my cohort was twenty three. I was um, the first two people to graduate after five years, got a tenure track position uh, in upstate New York, and um, while I wasn't necessarily teaching anything. Uh, related to procurement, which as most people don't know, was my, it was my dissertation on. Um, I, I did start by um, offering a course on, on um, um, uh, film and, and sexuality in comparative perspective. And I had a very um, funny uh, experience um, and I could not, nothing prepared me for it. You know, I had this, this backlash in the classroom and it was, it was very conservative place I was the only uh, a black woman um, faculty there uh, in upstate New York. And um, three years after I just, you know, I just left the institution. I literally walked out. Um, a lot of things happened, but what broke the camel's back was when um, twice my office door was defaced and racialized. And when I went to the director of security, guy told me, you know, it was very direct, you know, said, I'm sorry, but I have been instructed to do nothing. So, so, so here I was, Black woman, you know, I played it by the book, you know, uh, leaving Cameroon and, and, and doing uh, my, going through the educational um, uh, uh, track and getting my PhD. And yet my PhD could enter the classroom, but not myself, either as a queer person or as an African woman, and nothing prepared me for that. Um, so I, I, I literally left, and uh, I had to ask myself if this means, you know, the end of my academic career. Am I am I comfortable with this decision? And I said, yes, I am. So I've been in that space where I sort of I was in and out at the same time, and um, as always, it allowed me to 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 explore, right. Um, so I started this manuscript. I couldn't really go past the first two pages or three pages. Then I had a healthcare uh, scare in in 2019, where I actually thought I was going to to die. Um, I was diagnosed with uh, breast cancer, and I told myself, if I'm going to die, I need to leave something <laughs> to the world. So this book um, is not just uh, the me or my inner self, my true self, my true voice. I think I, it is the the book that embodies my voice. In it, I found my voice, and because I have been not so much embedded in, in your traditional academia, um, I was free because I wasn't writing it for for anybody. I wasn't writing it to get um, uh, raving reviews. I was just being fully present as I am writing about presence. Mm -hmm. so, so that is the space of having left the kind of the, 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 the conformism and whatever of academic uh, circles and just having the freedom to be and be myself. And I've had, I've have, I have had several years of observing myself interacting with academia. And there is a certain type of academia that is not of interest to me. And I wanted to write uh, beautifully, but um, in a way that is inviting to the broader public. Um, and as you see, um, the, the um, endorsement are from political scientists, from people who study theology, from folks in history and literature. And, and I do think that that is my, my true self because I, I have never really liked being bound to something. So um, it, it is this spirit that just, I'm always curious about stuff, you know, and, and I think I like making um, uh, weird connections um, that's how my mind works uh, between things that are seemingly unrelated 
So that's the space that I was able to explore and, and produce this, this work. And I think that my other work, at least in this line of uh, writing, are going to be um, similar or, or even better. Mm. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, I mean, I, uh, as, as a reader, I, uh, yeah, I, I felt all of that, uh, the loss that you started talking about um, and, and also anger. And actually I was, you know, that, that, that story you put in the introduction of the preface. And I was like, this is, I mean, you're writing in the U S and here you are being silenced um, about, you know, talking about sexuality uh, through film. And I mean, it's a course, right. And then, and yet, you know, uh, when we think about the U.S., we think of, you know, progressive issues and, and we only associate this kind of silencing or promoting of homosexuality, as you were called to be doing. We only think of this as something happening in Africa, particularly in West Africa. And, and there it was in the academy, in the academic space. And it's like, wow, this is, yeah, this is weird. So thank you for sharing that story. Um, so let's get into the book. So in the book, you develop a, a framework of Africana queer presence as an ethic of negotiation. So wrestling with society within and beyond one's materiality, negotiating power, desire and belonging, pain and rejection. You call queerness a metamorphosis. Queerness is metamorphosis. And I really like that. It is love and body-centered, death and resurrection affirming. And I want to talk about this idea of death and resurrection because I, I, I mean, I want to link it to another, to, to um, uh, other creatives in South Africa who are doing this work on death and resurrection. And it came up so much in this book of yours. So I'll come back to that. Um, but <clears throat> what, I, what, what intrigued me was how you see queerness as a container or content for intersectional and intercontextual yearnings and modes of being, of belonging sexuality being one of them. You've already talked about the fascination um, of uh, scholars to, like, to centralize sexuality in queerness. And yeah, and, and, and you, you've had such a wonderful critique on that. Um, and most of us who do work on queerness, as I've said, artistic and or activist endeavors, we are drawn to sexuality and to some extent to gender identity. Um, and the, I mean, this kind of impulse to centralize sexuality in our work does not, you know, I think it's too strong. And we, um, and I, 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 I'm wondering if you found ways to, to really think about it beyond just sexuality. But what you've done is to offer a, 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 you know, a queer ethic that can take us forward. So you say that African queerness is not satisfied with simple ontological pursuits. It remains appreciative of negotiation with history, of negotiation with history including the history of post-colonial post queer negations and possible futures in the now. Do we have an idea or an image of these futures in the now? Mm -hmm. Yes, um, thank you. Uh, first, I want to sort of uh, piggyback on this idea of fragility, right? Um, mm. um, I think my, my journey, my experience um, shows me and that um, although we experience both solidarity with, um, with the West uh, when it comes to queer issues, um, in part because we do not have, perhaps I don't know about South Africa, but by and large activism is funded by non-African non sources um, in Africa, that it is kind of this solidarity but I, th I wish that solidarity could move beyond the queer issue itself. So simultaneously, um, as an African queer person, um, you find yourself in solidarity when it comes to queerness, but not always that doesn't translate into solidarity for being African. And I think that this is really a conundrum that we have to, to, to admit and explore, right? Um, now back to uh, this idea of uh, uh, resurrection that you also mentioned. Um, of course, I'm, I'm using theological language a little bit there. Um, um, that's not because I want people to be Christian, but what is fascinating to me in the, the, the stories about resurrection you know, of, of a guy in Palestine is the, is the transformation of the body. Mm -hmm. People say, oh, Jesus was resurrected. 
yeah, fine. Except nobody recognized him ever after that. You know, <laughs> that's the point I'm trying to make. So, so if this body, this, this body that we start with, and I'm coming back to your question, this body we start with that is uh, branded in particular ways, this body that is animated and present in diverse ways that we're calling queer or LGBT or what have you, the future, which is in the present now, should give itself to something that becomes evanescing, out of ordering, where we start with something, the body, but something that we don't recognize anymore. Why? Because it has transcended the limitation of the thing, which is the body, the, the sex, the this and that. I am fascinated by the ability, the queer, or, 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 or whatever you call it, right? Uh, positioning offers in order to think economics, in order to think water and sanitation, in order to think infrastructure, in order to think pleasure, in order to think uh, commitment, in order to think transformation. All of those things are part and parcel of the work that I see if indeed we are allowed to resurrect that, 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 that this body we are talking about, allow it to be integrated without the fear and actually afford it the possibility to, 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 to become misrecognized. Mm -hmm. Because what would have happened then is that it's something that people wonder about. And there is a difference between shunning and wondering. And that's where we are not yet. We are stuck in the discourse of, you recognize me as such or screw you. Forgive my French, right? <laughs> but, 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 but how about just tilting a little bit? How about I'm wondering about you? Isn't that beautiful? So that is resurrection. The mother of the guy didn't even recognize him. I, I, are you the one? Uh, he, in fact, he calls him the gardener. Oh, where, where have they put them? It looks like the tomb is, is, is empty for those who don't read the Bible. They, they may be lost now, but I'm talking about the story of Jesus and how he, he came out of the tomb. So, so, so the point is that even the most intimate relationships could not recognize the resurrected body. Mm -hmm. If we can do that, that is the future, which is in the present. Because in some ways, even in the homophobia and the, the crisis, there is a bit of not knowing, but it hasn't turned into a question of wonder, not just wondering as questioning, but wonder as I am in awe about mm. what has happened to you. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I now I see where you said uh, queer bodies in Africa are spiritual. <laughs> yes. Yeah, sure. So, but you also say, uh, Coco, that resurrection is queer. Okay, it is. and I was so taken by this, and it took me back to uh, Kolega Putuma's play. Kolega is a, a playwright, a poet uh, in South Africa, uh, and she has a play called No Easter Sunday for Queers, uh, and also a, a play that Mamela Nyamza and um, Mojisola Adebayo, Adebayo did many years ago called I Stand Corrected. I am reminded of the play, particularly Putuma's play, um, No Easter Sunday for Queers, uh, as both you uh, and Putuma reference the body of the crucified Jesus, and you've just done that, and reading that body queerly in its transformation, and you ask about its resurrection, and that's the resurrection of crucified minorities. Of course, you, um, you, know, you make this more in relation to the two films that you study in this book, Proteas and Carmen Guy. And it's so liberating to see the potentiality of queerness in resurrection, what you call inviting touch, defying death. So, and it does not put blockages on future trajectories of the body, as you just stated. So the body, the body becomes a wonder, like mm. it, it comes back and we're like, wow, what is this? So this is the same body that in the everyday life is a yep. body of restrictions, yep. but 
in the future of the now or if the, in the now future, it mm -hmm. becomes a different kind of body. So Coco, does this looking towards resurrection focus not block the possibilities of a limitless present? And, and now I'm correcting myself. First I said of the present, but now I'm putting a limitless present. Yeah? So how can queers or queer people imagine their present lives and bodies as, such, as sites of resurrection? as futures in the present or present futures? Good question. Um, one of the things I do in the book is to really listen to characters that are not obviously queer. And so in um, Proteus, you end up thinking about indigenous cosmology for me, as the most queer site or, or moment or space. And it has nothing to do with bodies, right? In Carmen Gay, there are very peculiar characters that I call really queer. And one of them is a Catholic priest, for God's sake. Uh, <laughs> uh, don't you like that? <laughs> um, <laughs> and then one of them is blind. Just a singer by the sea. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm pointing out these um, uh, features of the book to think about your question about limitless, limit, limitless presence. Queer as a privilege of critique. I think it, it's a privileged space for critique. We'll always have a function as long as we live in this realm of organized politics. So I am not um, uh, or afraid that queer might, might vanish. What I'm saying is evanescing. It will penetrate everybody because there is no such a thing as the queers think or feel or do or expect or dream. What I'm trying to say is that Queerness is the privilege that we can afford. We can let everyone, we can welcome everyone. So it becomes a matter of a true us, not us versus them. So it's not something that we are losing. It's something that is societal. It is something that is deeply, deeply relational all the time. Now you left me alone here. Hey, why are you it? <laughs> okay, I think I say to uh, uh, internet has is is uh, off. Something happened. Uh, uh, Essen, I think we can continue with that thought of queerness as a privilege we can afford. Mm -hmm. I think they too will be joining us just now. Yes. So, so this is affordable. It is affordable because it is um, uh, uh, um, profoundly transformational. It is a way of looking, of seeing. It is being set aside for the work of transformation for the work of metamorphosis. And that is the meta, the big picture, transforming the big picture, not change. Change in politics means I vote you in if I like you and I vote you out of office if I don't like you, right? But, but if we want to, to do better, if we want to imagine a space that truly becomes neither nor, then we have to hold not only our specific identities on one hand, but Africa on the other. As I said, there will never be an identity that becomes the container of Africa. There will always be Africa that becomes a container of everything, of all of us. 
it is, and it is in the deep, in the depths of the soul of the self that we can begin to imagine and practice with our head and our heart a new way of relating of of being compassionate of caring of being honest with ourselves and that that is that is what i call spirituality sorry dear you you left me here so i was just trying to no okay. keep it going <laughs> You know, there also on the on the net there are also other things that happen. You know, I so know, I, I know. yeah, <laughs> so I had to acknowledge those presence and just deal with them. So mm -hmm. I am back now. Um, oh. <clears throat> so thank you. Uh, I want to talk about Senghor, mm -hmm. the influence that Senghor has on your work, and mm -hmm. particularly Senghor's idea of freedom, or more specifically the human the humanistic approach to liberty, um, which you draw from Senghor. Um, how you develop queerness through this frame, I found it quite beautiful in this book. Uh, so I was intrigued by how you use negritude, mm -hmm. um, write about death. And of course, uh, we've just talked about resurrection and other things, but you write about death. And of course, death um, is a phenomenon that queer subjects negotiate daily, particularly in Africa. So there's a sentence that really got to me. And I quote from the book, death does not need extra hired hands. The death dealing theater distracts the Negro from life, close quote. And I suppose that as queers, we, we are also so familiar with death and enticed by it that we seem to forget what life is. Is the death of the Negro similar to the negation of queerness and queer subjects through heterosexuality's compulsive death, as you put it? And I point, I point this out because you sort of allude to this in the chapter on the film Pro Proteus. So for me, the question is, what is life for queer subjects and queerness? Mm -hmm. At the end of the chapter on Proteus, you state, I quote again, whether in birth or death, life is a journey, close quote. Mm -hmm. And in the film, actually in both films, Proteus and Carmen Guy, in these films, it is, it's a journey back to see. I'll come back to this notion of see. So I wonder about what other queer life journeys, what is this, what is life, what is this life that queers, like the Negro, are distracted from? So what is it that queers are distracted from? Mm -hmm. And what is, what is life for queer subjects? Mm -hmm. is, is it about the journey's destination or perhaps the journey itself? I don't know, just talk to us about the journey of queer life. Yeah. So does the, the death of the Negro, uh, same as the death of the queer? Um, yes and no. Um, yes, because In the sort of map that I offered, I try to come up with a model. Um, queerness is, is an embodiment. Cannot escape the body. Although as I'm saying, it doesn't need to be stuck in the body only. So encountering Africa is encountering bodies, territories, landscape, uh, resources, everything. So I'm going to interchangeably now use Negro as a placeholder for Africa, right? So anything that happens to Africa happens to the queer. And that is why in the next stage of liberation, where Africa starts saying, go back, we need freedom, independence, post-colonial, what have you. What happens there is very interesting. So this sort of queerness that was part of the grand narrative without necessarily expressing itself as such, because we know that so many 
queer people have contributed to nationalist discourses and practice and resistance, yet they are not known as such. It's just scholarship sort of uncovering these now for us, right? So in the second day, on the second day, post uh, freedom, and by this I mean uh, Independence Day, what happened there is that the queer subject is still there, but now it is confronted with both this tension, which is the, 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 the need and a very important need of criticizing and, and becoming aware of history. You know, so, so when people say, oh, we don't want to be colonized, we don't want to be told what to do, I get that. And that is where queer becomes annoying. <laughs> because what it is doing, and this is now what I'm talking about, it's really a privileged uh, space to be at, is that it has to offer critique that addresses two things, not just one. First is this history of colonization, which alienates the queer from the former colonizers. And this sort of new history of uh, emancipation without uh, uh, participation of all, which annoys the nationalist or what have you. So in that case, in the second day, the, the day post-independence, the death of the queer, uh, I actually refused the death of the queer, in, in, as you see in, in the two, two books, because the sea, as you rightly point out, is not just a seat, you know, a, a metaphor for, for our emotions. So the C in the book is what emotion is to Senghor. Now, Senghor became controversial when he said, l'émotion est nègre et la pensée est laine. So emotion, I'm going to paraphrase, is, is, is black. Reason is Greek. Now, when he said that, and when he was received as if saying, black people have no reason, right? Like only white people can do philosophy and things like that. But that's not what he was saying. Because now, even among the Western tradition, good scholarship is actually coming back to single and saying, look at this thing that we just sort of abandoned because we were following this other thing. Saying God takes us to the sea, it says to us, to Africa, your wealth is inside you. Your wealth is in your capacity to relate. And believe me, that is not a, 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 a small feat. So the sea is the ocean of black consciousness, whether it is in Africa, sailing through the ships, uh, slave ships to, to America and Latin America or, or, or to India. That is the sea. And yes, Proteus jumps, but I'm saying, you know, th there is an irony here because as a sea god in the Greek mythology, it seems to me that from South Africa in sort of a way, anachronistically, <laughs> so he, he jumps so that he can be in conversation with, with Angelique, who also uh, uh, dies in the same sea of African sea, right? Um, so death of the body here occur occurs, but it doesn't have the same meaning. Uh, Carmen dies, but not the same death as, as Angelique, right? So, so, so um, I refuse death. Uh, 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 at least I don't want to think that the death, death of the body is what I'm talking about. The body is changing, but leaving us with something to wonder about, to ponder about, to, 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 to take with you, with, with us, something that goes beyond the body and, and even beyond anything that we can imagine. So I think here that um, the idea of emotion is, is, is rational um, and it allows us to to entrevoir, to see between the betweenness of things, not just the either or, the gay, the straight, the, the what have you, the African and non-African, but how about to see between? But when you want to see between, the in-betweenness of things, you, you, you have a glimpse. You don't have a pretension to know it all. You don't have a, a, an appetite for grand formula and, and, and conclusion and inferences. You, you have a glimpse. And that's the epiphany of the soul, of, of the mind, of the body. 
and we need more epiphanies right now. Yeah, okay, we need more epiphanies. Okay, let's, let's talk about this, the one on the sea. So this is my final thought, because I had two other questions, but I don't think we have time, um, specifically on Carmen Guy and on Angelique's death, but we can take that offside. The connections drawn uh, between queerness in Senegal and in South Africa through these two films, Proteus and Carmen Guy. And what the opportunities or possibilities that you, you offer here. So queer conscription, conscription, what you note as carceral time and crisis time in the post-colony. So this is one. The importance of the sea, which you've just mentioned, both met metaphorically and physically as a connector, a beginning and a final flow. Carceral time and crisis time at the end of the book reminded me of another form of time, residence time, as explored by Christina Sharp in the book In the Wake on Blackness and Being. And I want to quote this notion of residence time because it is relevant for the work you've developed here, Essen, particularly your concluding chapter. And this is what Christina Sharp says. The amount of time it takes for a substance to enter the ocean and then leave the ocean is called residence time. Human blood is salty and sodium has a residence of 200 and million, 260 million years. And what happens to the energy that is produced? What happens to the energy that is produced in the water? It continues cycling like atoms in residence time. We black people exist in the residence time of the wake. I close that quote from Christina Sharp. I draw on this idea of residence time because uh, of the wake and how you start at the sea and also end at the sea. Yeah, both films allow you to do that because both Carmen Guy, you know, and also there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a woman who's standing at the sea and is kind of like beckoning the waters. And, um, and in, even in, um, in Proteus, you know, um, class blank <laughs> goes back to the sea. So, but the main thing that sits with me, okay, especially in this final chapter of the book, um, is, is, is both the sea, but I'm trying to read the sea through this lens of what you present um, as Mundu, okay? And I mean, we are very familiar with the notion of Umtu and Mundu and Du within African context, particularly Southern Africa. Uh, realizing our highest call to affirm and protect Africana personhood, that passed through our whole being. Those are your words, not mine. And you say Muntu is very much about human, or I say about human and its condition. I wonder though about the conditions of queer subjects um, you write about and their possibilities of being Muntu um, as presented here. All of them face death. Of course, you, you've already denied death, <laughs> you've said that, but the reality is that all of them face death. And it is not clear what ability they possess to protect their own personhood. So what does Mundu mean in the context of Africana queer personhood? Well, um, we, we will all die someday, everything dies. And that is part of the natural cycle of things. Um, um, as a Koko, I also know we don't die. In the same breath, I can say the same things because uh, my ancestors came before me. My ancestors are now, they're coming back from the future and, and I become an ancestor myself. Um, so uh, energy is not wasted, it's just recycled. Um, that's number one. I like this thing you're doing with uh, residence um, time um, to reside in something. Isn't that beautiful? Um, but when I'm talking about passing through, it's kind of the same thing. We walk side by side. We sleep together sometimes. We march, we protest. Um, but I don't think we've imagined very well what it means to pass through. Because 
let's talk about this guy who came out of a tomb, right? And the other story is that his friends were kind of gathering and shivering and kind of wondering about what happened and whether somebody was going to come after them. And while they were there, he says he just passed through the door and said, hey, hey, buddy, I'm here, I'm back. To pass through something, what does it mean to pass through concrete? Let alone to pass through a human being. What kind of thing must we be to do that? And I think we have to release this kind of um, uh, uh, fascination with matter and, and it, it, it's, it's finitude, right? We have to think about something else. What is this that passes through us? Emotions. I'm not just talking about emotion in kind of raw sense of the term, but I'm talking about emotion in the sense of singor. So, so, so the, the Muntu, uh, as conceptualized by Ebusi Bulanga, is a kind of a subject in crisis. And what I was trying to do in that chapter, the last chapter, was to address the following question, which, which can be a good critique to, to my, my book. Uh, and, and, and we have heard this in different um, contexts, which is to say, listen, folks, nice conversation, we love you, but this is not just a priority right now. Right, we, we gotta do development. We gotta take care of babies. We gotta figure this out and that, you know, inflation. But this is not this is not for now. Meaning that, from a Muntu perspective, a subject in crisis, which, according to Ebusi uh, Bulanga, is very much important in the the definition of a personhood in Africa, which is to say that you folks are not part of this crisis or that. You are not, um, um, we don't see how what you, you're talking about is relevant, right? But, but when you really think about what he's doing there in his own understanding of this space, where we can all be in crisis and we can all be hopeful for, for, for tomorrow and we can all be part of envisioning tomorrow, the, the kind of subject he's talking about, oh, it, it is this kind of subject that can pass through that can sit, like you say, take residence, try taking residence in a different body and try not to possess that body. You know, that's why they say this person is possessed, you know, folks, African, what I, what I mean, you know. You know. So, so, so we're not talking about possession, but what does it mean to reside and, and let go? You see, all the problems that we have today, whether it is racism, or homophobia, or the discourse about abortion and what the woman has to do or not. They stem from one simple thing, the inability to take residence. Because if I were to take residence in the body of a woman who is carrying life, but at the same time so distraught that she wanna push that life out of her and just sit there for five minutes, maybe I'll, I'll come out with, with more understanding. If, 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 if a white person could, could, could sit and reside two minutes in a, a body, black body that is about to be lynched, you know, or, or the neck of a black person about to be crushed, or just take that bullet, you know, and, and just sit with it, with the promise that you won't die, by the way, just, just the experience of it. You know, we have, now we are into the kind of enhanced reality, sci-fi, but it is a reality that we still don't leave. That is what the concept of indigenous spirituality does. It doesn't promise you salvation after you die in your body. It promises you, death while you are alive. So you can be transformed as a person and as a character to become relevant to your society. Those are two different models. And that is really what I think that the conversation about our spirituality, our ways of thinking, the human adds to this scholarship and ways of talking and embodying and thinking about queerness. 
Thank you so much, Coco. Thank you so much. You've taken us to, you know, uh, places we probably never imagined, places we're scared to imagine, and places we've been thinking about but didn't know how to articulate. So your words have really um, done a lot. Um, your your book is amazing. It's it's so rich. It's it, it's difficult. <laughs> it's a difficult text, I must add. Um, but it's, it, yeah, it offers so much. Uh, your wisdom uh, and your courage to be able to say the things that you say. Um, I mean, I think there's your, your final words around a character that, you know, that offers something in society is what we need to work towards. I, yeah, that will sit with me because I think that is so important. Um, that's really what we need to develop within uh, our African societies. Thank you so much. I think you've, you've had a lot to say. So it's probably now time to just sit back a little bit and then listen to Nehemiah, who, will, um, who is the respondent to the book. Thank you so much, Gogo. Thank you. Thank you so much for this insightful conversation. I now hand over to Dr. Nahamaya Latola for the book launch. My word, <laughs> what a journey that conversation has been. I wanna start by greeting everyone who's joining us this afternoon. I'd like to thank the organizers and the author for giving me the opportunity to form part of this suspicious uh, uh, a moment of, 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 of launching this book as to, to echo Prof. Matt Debeni that um, the, the, the book is a hard read for her. Then imagine what is the, uh, how much the book is a reading for me <laughs> as a natural scientist coming into this space. But um, I want to do things a little different this afternoon. I want to start by calling on an African tradition of spirituality by delivering a prayer or a meditation through the words of Ocean Vong, or author and poet, who negotiates his queerness through the world by the reading of The Bull. He stood alone in the backyard, so dark, the night purple around him. I had no choice. I opened the door and stepped out. Wind in the branches, he watched me with kerosene blue eyes. What do you want? I asked, forgetting I had no language. He kept breathing to stay alive. I was a boy, which meant I was a murderer of my childhood. And like all mur murderers, my God was stillness. My God, he's still there like something prayed for by a man with no mouth. The green-blue lamp swirls in its socket. I didn't want him. I didn't want him to be beautiful, but needed beauty to be more than hurt, gentle enough to hold. I reached for him. I reached not the bull, but the depths, not the answer, but an entrance of a shape of an animal like me. Thank you so very much for humoring me there. Um, in my response, in the prolific work, Africana Queer Presence, Ethics and Political Negotiation, the author, Dr. Ennis Nyek, explores the and extracts from Fulham's Proteas and Carmen Ghee to present, and I quote, a philosophical rendering that transforms the forlorn scripts of negation, which denigrates queerness, to positivist narrations of queerness as hope through transcendental relational ethics, to borrow from Dr. Reverend Smallwood in the praises. The author, similarly to Don Zono, in his writings on teaching alternative and indigenous gender systems in world history, a queer approach, approaches queerness and history as arriving at the thinking of how strange and peculiar one's own context and assumptions are when confronted by the vast arrays of interpretations as so masterfully uh, uh, presented in this book of reality through time and space. Nyek describes the book as not seeking to queer Af Africa, but rather about retrieving queer voices and performances from within and their contribution to conversations within and beyond 
identity politics today. Like the author, I want to start off by saying I am not a film analyst. I am rather a, naturally, a natural scientist trained chemist using my tools acquired for meaning making through art by means of fashion and poetry. Additionally, I am selfishly drawn to critically consider the body and masculinities, religion, sex and gender, and sexuality. My research as a chemist intersects Indigenous knowledge systems through the explorations of plant species used for the treatment of illness and disease. Thus, in response, I want to grapple together with the author on the use of Indigenous knowledge systems recalling Smallwood towards positivist narrations of queerness as hope through transcendental re relational ethics. Firstly, by indigenous knowledge systems, I'm referring to the knowledge developed within indigenous societies, independent of and prior to the advent of, modern, of the modern scientific knowledge system. It is the knowledge held and passed down by the elders in the socialization of the youth as asserted by day. In Proteus, Klaus Blanc, when asked about where he acquired his knowledge, responded through the teachings of his grandparents, to his mother, to himself. The choice of the two film Proteus set in the 17th century colonial South Africa and Carmen Guy set in post-colonial Senegal at first glance seemed to only consider Africana imagination as arrive at the arrival of the colonizer. However, the presence of indigenous knowledge systems, particularly in Proteus, presents Africa as a site of production of knowledge and innovation. Indigenous knowledge systems for both class and Carmen are read as tools by which they navigate their worlds. The card game to predict the success of a mission for Carmen, and probably most pro prominently in, pro in Proteus class first, denying himself and then um, um, embracing his indigenous personhood as knowledge bearing and worldly. A different distillation or another distillation could be that through indigenous knowledge systems class who gained social capital and outside of his negotiation towards self-realization in the narrative could evade the law and demise, um, a life as an assistant to Virgil Neve, the Scottish botanist. Probably most pivotal to my grapplings together with the author is the presence of indigenous knowledge through Bulaga's philosophical view of Muntu, which presents itself in various African cultures towards personhood. With the author arriving at the distillation that Muntu clearly affirmed holds that we, give, that we get to, the, to realizing our highest calling to affirm and protect Africana personhood by appreciating the musicalities and forms of animation that passes through our whole being. This for me situates indigenous knowledge systems as fucant to recall the author's words with the required returns and life bearing transformational gestures of Africana multiplicities. Again, I would like to thank the author and the organizers for this uh, opportunity. Um, and uh, with that, I, I yield back. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you so much, Dr. Nehemiah Latola. Um, we shall now move on to the Q&A session. Just a quick reminder that if you have any questions, please raise your hand or leave your questions in the chat box or Q&A box down below. Um, I think we will start with a question from Dr. Azrini. Asha, my question's been answered. So my hand should be down. Okay, sure, no problem.
Hi, Simran. There's a question. Uh, Dalin's hand is up. Okay. I'm on my phone, so I can't see the video. So sorry about that. Um, I'm just speaking because nobody else is speaking. So um, forgive me for that. Anyway, I'm Professor Darlene Miller. I'm from the Tabombeke African School at um, UNISA. And I think part of my reaction and possibly other people is to be quite blown away. These are those kinds of seminars where, you know, you kind of get lost for words because there's so much amazing that's just gone on here today. But let me try to find some mode of articulating this feeling of awe and, and gratefulness that I have. And it's to say that what one, what is becoming increasingly apparent is that we are finding the new language for the future. Karl Marx always used to say you can't build the future on the basis of old language. So we can't actually build the future on the basis of Marxism, we can't build the future on the basis of socialism. We have to find a new language that that speaks to what our new sensibilities are. And what is so amazing about this presentation and the discussion and the book that I will now rush to go and read is that it's one of the most um, significant decoloniality interventions precisely because it is a critique of the secular it is an integration it's that it's the disruption of that binary that we have between secular rationalism and spirituality and indigeneity on the other hand so um, secular rationalism and the enlightenment and everything the white boys told us to believe and they told us the way to speak and think and write and do Telemachus journal articles. All of that is on the one side. And the other, on the other side is us here trying to find our voice and beginning so powerfully to find our voices, not beginning, but uh, expanding that journey. And so this disruption of that Cartesian divide between reason on the one hand and emotion, indigenous, spirituality, African cosmology. We can only be grateful to authors like our presenters for bringing, for giving us the language to express what is so deeply embedded in our bodies. Thank you so much. So that was more of a comment than a question. Now, maybe someone else has something more interesting to say by now. Thank you so much, Darlene. I see a hand from Asrini again. Okay. I don't see any questions in the chat or Q&A. Oh, yes. Laurel Sprague. Hi, thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you for this, this conversation. I'm similarly uh, really in awe and working to, to find my language, um, including the new language. But, so um, Dr. Niak, I have a question and um, we've also known each other for quite some time, but what, one thing that I'm struck by is how much other discourse, other queer discourse, especially in the West is about uh, the performative, right? It's about performance, and so and and the way we perform our our identities, and it just seems to me that what you're talking about and what you're writing about, even using um, even using art and film as as the messenger, is the opposite of the performative. It's actually the most fundamentally real. Um, uh, uh, the, the the language and the the attention is, is is really trying to maybe excavate what is you know most fundamentally real, and I'm just wondering if you have any thoughts on um, <clears throat> on this and, and and sort of on this whether 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 this is something that you see as well as this, this as a difference in approach. Thank you. Yes. Um, thank you. Um, in the book, I sort of develop something called the Pygmalionics, uh, which is part of uh, the simulacrum of identity. And I want to break that down in sort of language that everybody can understand. Um, so um, a simulacrum is kind of a reproduction of a thing without the original. 
a reproduction of a thing without the original. So the issue I would say is not so much performance because um, in Africa, Africa is a very uh, rhythmic, the rhythm, this is another thing that is very important to sing all, very rhythmic place. Uh, a lot of dance and, and mask and, and this and that. Uh, but it's never about the reproduction of a thing without the original. What do I mean by that? A performance, we can be performing, except that if we empty the body from, let's say, emotions, or if we make emotions become purely aesthetics, but aesthetics, things that are uh, expressed here in the act of performance, it is a kind of a second level of abstraction. But when I enter my ritual space to dance, and I'm wearing an elephant mask or a cheetah mask or what have you. The cheetah is present, very much present, as well as my body present. So in, in the, the indigenous African ritual places, spiritual places, there is no performance that tries to reproduce something without the original. And that's where the problem is. So we can perform emotions, but let us not be emotional, right? We can perform relationships, but let's not be relational. We can perform democracy, but let us not actually practice it, right? Let me give you an example in terms of world politics right now. Uh, there is a bill in the Senate here in the US uh, introduced by a Democrat that is supposed to force the entire continent of Africa, the entire continent of Africa, people, business, uh, states, to give account of their relationship with Russia. Now, I, I, I don't want to take sides, right? Or, or, or even comment on, on what is going on. But the point is, let us imagine Ethiopia and the AU, for example, having a meeting and drafting such a, a bill to say to the United States to give account of his relationship with, I don't know, X. That would be unthinkable. So, so we can perform democracy, but we don't have to embody it. So, so what you're raising here as a question is important. And it is, I think, from a, an indigenous perspective or, or paradigm, really fundamentally different. We embody the thing we perform. We keep the original as we are moving forward. We remember the ancestor as we are moving forward. In the film, uh, uh, Proteus, Class Blanc's mother's breast is uh, are cut off. She's killed her breast, cut off, and sold to become this pouch that can be transact transacted in the market of fans. She will not be part of that marketplace, but the market will be hailed as the response to the failure of society. That is what I'm talking about. So thank you for your question. You are right. I'm talking about a fundamentally different um, uh, paradigm when thinking about uh, politics, culture, body, and imagination. Thank you. Fantastic, thank you so much. Um, I think Professor Matabeni has a question. No, I, I don't, Simran. <laughs> I mean, I have many questions, but I don't think I need to ask a question. I think the question came up from elsewhere. Okay, sure, no problem. Oh, um, yes, so we have a question from Azrini. Um, Oh, Dr. Nyek, do you think the techniques of governance within the social legal constructs create performances or spaces where upon possibilities of bodies, even bodies out of place are liminal, thus generating a new way of knowing and being 
moving between and in between past, present and future? My answer is no, and it depends on what we mean by governance, right? So um, one of the works I am using, or at least the framework uh, I'm using is one developed by, not in this book, when, when I do my public procurement work, um, uh, by Bata Feynman, uh, the vulnerability theory. And, and what she has uh, consistently showed is that the subject of a liberal legal discourse does not exist. That person is not a human being because this, this subject is fundamentally autonomous and independent, those two things. But when you look at real life, you and I in flesh and blood, you are born, you need milk from someone else and you need somebody to send you to school and et cetera. And then you get married and what have you, or you don't and you, you, you get ill and somebody has to take care of you and you lose your job and you get old and somebody has to help you. And at some point, somebody has to hold your hand to take your last breath. So when you actually look at human life, human life can never be conceptualized as independent. It can never be conceptualized outside of relationship. So why is it that when we're thinking about, and I'm using this because you talk about the socio-legal, the socio-legal context cannot get us there because that body, the assumption, you know, at least in the, I'm talking about the liberal tradition right now, the assumption put on that body uh, are fundamentally out of tune with the reality of human life. And that is why in all um, um, situation of domination, be they of colonialism or, or apartheid or whatever, the law always plays a central role because it is not about reality. It is about a fiction. So my answer would be no. I'm not saying that uh, uh, law is irrelevant, but it helps to know what it can achieve and cannot. So fixing our society is not about more criminalization or less criminalization. It is about getting uh, 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 tuning to back to our, our ourselves and 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 making our institutions reflect as much as possible our own reality, our own truth, so that we are in sync as opposed to out of sync with uh, our social projects. Thank Perfect. Thank you so much for that response. Um, over to you, Dr. Nehemiah. So again, I want to be a little selfish <laughs> and just jump in while uh, you are here, uh, Doc. Um, I think while I was reading and I was thinking about this uh, indigenous knowledge system or this world that you open up through your through your writing, I I, I was probing um, and and I was particularly taken by your analysis of Bulaga's being in self through being for self through being for others. And you, you've spent some time talking about that through the, the, the function of the word through there in that, in that reading. Um, and when I was thinking about indigenous knowledges as transcendental, I wanted to probe or further the conversation with you of how do we see that as transcendental in, 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 in happening in practice um, where we are? And this is probably as the natural scientist, <laughs> we will always ask, so how does that work? How, how, do we, how do we see that happening in spaces? I know I've come across few uh, uh, writings in the South African context where there was the investigation of the concept of exploring closet and out of the closet versus the, the private space versus the public space. And they were using indigenous knowledge systems of the community, um, co-creating this knowledge towards transformation with stakeholders in a community, I think in KwaZulu-Natal with pastors and same-sex um, 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 partners and, and other stakeholders in the community. 
community. So I was just wondering if, if you have anything to, to say to that or answer to that type of thinking. Yes, um, thank you. Um, I think it's not, not just the chemists, uh, political scientists like to ask the same question. So how, how does it work in practice? Well, um, one of the things that uh, really struck me in my process of becoming a matriarch, um, so after the uh, uh, secret rituals, um, we had a public ceremony where I was presented to the community as a matriarch. And as I am uh, uh, being introduced to the community, I'm given certain things. One of them is a staff, second is a bag. Um, I am called, and by the way, in Cameroon, this, you, this is a public ceremony with um, uh, uh, public officials attending. So you have to invite county officials, the police, et cetera. Um, uh, this is what the, um, the senior person who is passing these things to me said. So she calls me by my name and then she calls me my prince and my princess. And then she proceeded to say, because today you are both. And she hands me uh, my tools. And nobody raised an eyebrow. It was a non-issue. Well, how, why? So the, the issue is not how does it work in practice? What I'm saying, it has always worked in practice. And part of the work we need to do, if and only if we can really get this idea that Africa will always be the content and any identity, the, 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 the container and any identity, the content, and listen respectfully and probe a little bit deeper. Only if we are willing to become this thing that is part of everybody, can we get to that point where we can actually recognize that which has always been there. And some of it is gonna be part of our own making because we are responsible for our own history. So not everything is gonna be from the past because as human beings, we invent and reinvent ourselves. But what I'm saying is that there is enough, enough um, subterranean uh, 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 richness that is sitting there and waiting for us to actually act as if Africa truly matters when it comes to the kind of scholarship and voice that we want to give to ourselves as African and Africanist um, uh, intellectuals. It is working in practice and the, the, where there is a will, there is a way. Thank you. Fantastic, thank you so much for that response. Um, I don't see any hands or other questions in the chat box. So Dr. Nyek, or, um, do you have any closing remarks? Well, this has been a wonderful time. Um, I want to leave you with another image, perhaps most popular, uh, the image of a Sankofa. I talk a little bit about it in the book. Sankofa comes from the uh, Aken um, cosmology in um, Ghana. And it has been uh, interpreted as a way of remembering the past while looking to the future. It is a bird that holds eggs in its mouth and um, flying one direction, but sort of looking towards the back. Um, one question I ask is, well, that's, that's one way, but how, how, how is it possible to do this? And then it struck me that in a way there is a third movement there that people don't talk about or that I didn't see in the literature. And that is the ability to be completely still in order to allow both movements. 
because and and, and this this bird has something you know there is a new generation new birth you know eggs in the mouth so on the one hand we what i'm doing in the book is tilting my head a little bit looking back looking forward but i also want to deeply sit with the moment and as i began this conversation with myself with the truth about my um, journey, not just intellectual journey, but my my body's journey, my Africanness journey, and and be honest to 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 its own fragility, as well as the uh, potential solidarities that it, it builds with with the world. What I like about single is that. He does the work of building black consciousness as Martin Luther King and other people have have done, but it doesn't stop there. And this is the beauty with black consciousness. It always gives something to the world. Now, people who don't get it think, oh, it's about identity and about you only. The hard work is to find that other thing that is about the world. The, 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 the sensitive, sensible, practical humanity. But we cannot love the other if we don't love ourselves, if we are not true to ourselves, if our scholarship does not reflect the deep seated truth about ourselves. So, so like this bird of the Akin, I want to encourage all of, all of us to keep looking forward, backward, but to also have the courage to sit deeply in the moment, to pass through the moment, through the bodies, through our own social reality, and they're right as if all that give us the spiritual material with which we are going to build the epiphany of the hour. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, that was wonderful. I now call on Ms. Fortuna Chwara to do the closing. Uh, thank you, Sanram. What a beautiful and thought-provoking this intellectual engagement has been. My name is Fortuna Chwara, and it is my pleasure today to give a short vote of thanks on behalf of the Chair for Critical Studies in Higher Education Transformation, known as Krishet. A huge thanks to Dr. Nyek, for today's conversation and insights around the important new work on African queer presence. To Prof Matebeni for facilitating and contributing to the conversation, thank you. And thank you to Dr. Latola for his insightful response to the book. This has been a very collaborative event and thanks much go to all the partners involved. Thank you to Dr. Makokwana, the Interim Director for the Center for Women and Gender Studies for spearheading the organization of this event. And to Prof Kola, the chair in African Feminist Imaginations and Prof Matebeni, the chair in Sexualities, Genders and Queer Studies for their support. Thank you also to Prof Kiet as DVC Engagement and Transformation for holding the space for these kinds of conversations to take place. Thank you very much to the organizing team from the Center for Women and Gender Studies, Sipoga for her work on coordinating the event, Wendy Adams for the administrative and logistics work, and Simran Chuklal for facilitating today. Thanks also to Ponto Mabena from the Nelson Mandela University Media Services for assisting with the live stream. Finally, thank you to all who have joined us for today's conversation. We appreciate the support and the intellectual engagement. We hope that you will join us again soon. And in closing, I'd like to urge that the Center for Women and Gender Studies will be hosting both an in-person and virtual seminar slash webinar uh, titled Black Women uh, in the Colony, um, that is Black Women in African Post-Colony. And the main speaker will be Prof. Yolande Boka and, and the discussant will be Zintle Kanobusase on the 25th of May. And this will be on a North Campus Conference Center from two until four. So if you'd like to RSVP, you can contact wendy.adams at mandela.ac.za. Thank you.
Thank you so much, colleagues. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much. It's been amazing. Thank you very much. Um, you are all wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Thanks, Zeta. You got me thinking. Got me thinking. Yeah. <laughs> it was good. It was good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Beautiful. Well, Thank you so much. That was, that was really great. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. right. Bye bye, everybody. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye.